The Pain Pod is produced by Bloodstream Media and made possible thanks to our sponsor, Tremo Pharmaceuticals. Visit ResetHAStudy.com to learn more about their work. Imagine it's 1863. You're a young man on the verge of adulthood. The American Civil War is in full effect, and Congress passes the Civil War Conscription Act of 1863, which establishes the first national draft and requires registration by every male citizen between the ages of 20 and 45. You are now a soldier. Now imagine it's 1865. You're 22 years old, the war is over, and you have survived. You return to civilian life in the hopes of moving forward, but grief and pain still lingers. You've lost friends, brothers, and even limbs. It gets harder to repress the images of what has happened and the pain, oh, the physical pain. It manifests, it persists, it grows. The war may be over, but the battle has just begun. Okay, you can now come back to being yourself. It's hard to think what our lives would be like if we lived in a different time and without certain things. For me, it's air conditioning. I couldn't live without air conditioning. And TV, yeah, TV. Well, I'm not a crook. Well, also my computer. Well, and I guess my phone. Oh, okay, you get the point. Advancements in technology and science can drastically change our lives and the world that we live in. But what drives this innovation? I'm going to ask you once again to imagine yourself as that young man from the Civil War. Imagine you live in a time before television, before social media, before air conditioning, and before adequate pain management. Ouch, right? In this episode, we continue our journey throughout history and discuss the events and people that helped push forward the advancements in pain management that we still see today. Hi, I'm Mel Forrest, and you're listening to The Pain Pod. Wars are amazing things. One of the worst ways anyone can imagine, really, of solving anybody's problems. They lead to technological advances in many areas, and medicine is one of them. This is Marsha Meldrum, an associate researcher professor in the Center for Social Medicine at the Semmel Institute at UCLA. Marsha is also our expert from episode one of this season. Marsha elaborates on why terrible things like war have sometimes helped push forward advancements, especially in medicine. Soldiers experienced severe wounds, amputations, nerve injuries during the war and lived afterwards and were often using morphine or laudanum to relieve the pain, which they were in really for the rest of their lives. Many of them developed what was essentially addiction, and it was the concern about the brave, sturdy soldiers that sort of led to doctors becoming worried about the use of any opiate on a, on a regular basis. As Marsha puts it, the concern for the brave, sturdy soldier pushes those in the medical field to find new approaches to pain. What you saw in the Civil War was a greater understanding of some kinds of pain by some physicians. You see this in World War I as well. What happens in World War II in particular, patients with the same type of injury get grouped together in the same kinds of wards. And physicians who might, for instance, see maybe one or two nerve injuries in the course of their practice, all of a sudden they, they can see, you know, a hundred patients with some kind of nerve injury. A hundred patients whose legs have been amputated. Now this, you know, changes their whole perspective on whatever problem the, the patient is facing. As new and distinctive viewpoints on pain emerged, there were three physicians that really stood out during this time. Two of the most noted physicians in this area were American, and the third physician, which I'll talk about, who's probably not so well known, but, well, he's, he's sort of, you know, someone I know very well because we have his papers at UCLA, and, and I've spent a, an inordinate amount of time reading his work, so I'll talk about him too. 
please do. So the first of these is Henry K. Beecher. Beecher is one of the more well-known physicians in American history because he was always inserting himself into controversy. I mean, he's well-known for getting involved in ethics controversies at a later stage. But he was an anesthesiologist. He was working with shock patients on the battlefields in Europe. And he made the rather remarkable observation that often soldiers who were severely wounded would complain of relatively little pain and would not demand morphine. And this was so very different from the patients whom he had seen back in his operating room back home as soon as they came out of the anesthesia and they asked for pain relief. Often, he said, the, the soldiers could be relieved with a cigarette. Why was this? So now imagine it's 1944 during World War II. You're a young man on the front lines of battle who's hurt. One of your limbs is wounded, badly. And while you're in the hospital, a young nurse comes by and on her rolling cart are bandages, scissors, and cigarettes. You take a drag and as you exhale, the pain subsides. Wait, what? Beecher decides to figure this out. So he read some literature, some psychological literature, and he developed what he called the reaction component, which in a, it's not a unique observation, but Beecher phrases it so well and encapsulates so much of what we now believe to be the key to the understanding of pain. And it's this. Pain is not the simple sensory uh, perception. Your nerves sense a particular type of pain in the injured area or the painful area. They send a, send a signal to your brain. Your brain says, ouch, that's, you know, that's the sensory perception of pain. That's what had been defined as pain by the neurologists. But when that sensory signal reaches the brain, it is integrated through the process of neural integration with cognitive and emotional information which is already, you know, already active in your brain. With your past experience of pain, with your understanding of the current situation, with your anticipation of what's going to happen to you next, with your fear about what's going to happen next, with your anxiety, and perhaps as the pain persists, then you become affected with a great sadness, a great depression because the pain isn't going away. So all these cognitive and affective signals can affect your pain to enhance the sensation or alleviate the sensation. But maybe we need an example. I will give you some very concrete examples, if you like. Bingo! One of the key factors in sensation, in perception of pain, is your anticipation of what's going to happen. What has happened and what's going to happen next? When I was in my 20s, I knew two girls. They were roommates. And it just happened that both of them had their wisdom teeth out within a, a month of each other. I guess we better give them names. We'll call them Mary and Anne. So Mary had her wisdom teeth out. This is a very common experience, somewhat painful. She had them out on a Friday. She came home. She spent the weekend in bed. And her boyfriend basically waited on her while she complained how much pain she was in. Oh, it was just terrible. And finally, and on Monday, then she pulled herself together and went back to work. Anne had her wisdom teeth out on a Wednesday morning. She went straight back to work. As soon as the anesthesia began to wear off, she took a couple of Tylenol, and that was it. She never complained any further. It wasn't that, you know, Anne was a, you know, a heroic person. It was just that she didn't notice the pain because she never anticipated that the pain would be overwhelming. She thought of the wisdom teeth as, as something that you have some pain, the pain goes away, and you go back to your, you know, your regular life. She put it out of her mind, and she would, her mind effectively did this so effectively that she really didn't feel the severe pain that her roommate had. So anticipation is a significant factor. And one of the things you might also look at is, what do you expect will happen? How do you expect other people to react to the situation? Marsha explains this further. So I'll tell you another story. I was walking in a park in London. This was a number of years ago, and there was a family in front of me. There was a mother, father, a couple of kids. They were all walking along, and the littlest kid fell down and, I don't know, scraped her knee or something. You know, she's a little kid. She was about 
too. She started to cry. Now, if that had happened to me um, or a lot of a lot of little kids, their mother would have dashed over, picked her up. Oh, are you all right? Let me kiss it and make it better. And the kid learns a lesson from that, right? They learn what happens if you have a little bit of pain, you make a fuss, people, you know, rush to your assistance. Okay, in this instance, it was the father who picked up the little girl. He said, oh, bad luck. And they went right on walking. (laughs) So the little girl learns from this. Ignore the pain and it will go away. So the point here is that I think most of us pick up what we anticipate about pain very early in life. This can change, obviously, if we have, you know, some sort of really traumatic or earth-shaking experience or if we develop some chronic pain. So back to Beecher's soldiers on the battlefield. Ah, yes. Let's go back to 1944. You're in the hospital, wounded and in pain. But one drag from that cigarette and the pain subsides. But why? The soldiers felt pain, but essentially their minds sort of dismissed it, not because it wasn't, you know, very painful, but because for them, they knew what it meant. It meant they were out of the battle. They were going to a nice, safe, comfortable hospital where people would take care of them. And this was going to happen very soon. So they were willing to wait. I mean, there was no rush. No, they were out of the battle and nobody was shooting at them anymore. Now imagine you're back to yourself. You live as you do today, and you may have minor surgery. When you're in a hospital, you're probably a little anxious about the surgery. You go in, you have the surgery, you wake up in a strange environment. The operation's over. Maybe it went all right, maybe it didn't, but you know you're going to be at least sitting at least a couple more days in the hospital Your regular routine is disrupted. You don't know when you're going to be able to go home. You're really sort of anxious. Okay, so what do you feel? You feel pain, and your anxiety makes the pain more intense. So that's what what Beecher perceived. And this is the key to understanding. It's really the key to understanding chronic pain. It is what makes chronic pain so difficult to manage and eliminate. So now, imagine you're you, and you have chronic pain. As you continue to have chronic pain, you suffer anxiety. You suffer depression. To some degree, you suffer social isolation. You even feel isolated from your doctor who can't resolve your problems. All of these emotions get wrapped up with your perception of pain. So that was Beecher's perception. And he wrote about 1946. We learn more about the physicians that helped push forward the advancements in pain management when we return after this brief word from our sponsor. Hi, my name is Patrick. As someone living with hemophilia and arthritis in my joints, I know firsthand how difficult and debilitating chronic pain can be. I also know the challenges that come with trying to find relief, which is why I'm excited to share with you the Reset HA study from Tremo. Tremo is founded with the goal of developing and delivering non-opioid pain therapies for people living with pain. Tremo's Reset HA study is a clinical research study for people who experience joint pain due to hemophilia. The study is evaluating an oral non-opioid investigational drug designed to be taken once a day to see if it may potentially help relieve joint pain and improve physical function in people with hemophilic arthropathy you may be eligible to participate in this clinical research study if you are between the ages of 12 and 75, have been diagnosed with hemophilia A or B, have chronic pain in one or more joints, and do not take opioid medication more than four days a week. If you are interested in learning more about taking part in Tremo's Reset HA study, visit ResetHAStudy.com. That's R-E-S-E-T-H-A-S-T-U-D-Y.com to find a study location near you. Reset the way you manage your pain. Visit ResetHAStudy.com today. The second physician really is is described as the founder of the pain field. Hi, and welcome back to Pain in the Past, Part 2, where we discuss the events and people that help push forward the advancements in pain management that we still see today. 
In this episode, I've been asking you to jump through space and time, imagining yourself in someone else's shoes. Thank you, by the way. I do this to show you that we're not so different. Sure, times change, we now have air conditioning, but the desire to further understand pain and the need for better pain management has been seen throughout history and persists today. So with that, we continue our journey through the past with Marsha Meldrum. Our next physician needs no introduction. Well, actually, maybe he does. He's the founder of the pain field, John Bonica. He was a young anesthesiologist, very junior to Beecher. He was working at a hospital stateside in Washington State, and he was constantly running up against pain problems that he'd never seen before and didn't know how to handle. So he talked to other doctors. He talked to neurologists, to psychologists, to other anesthesiologists, to the surgeons, to everyone, anyone who thought might be able to give him some help. And in, in his words, he said, I discovered that they didn't knew less than I did. But it, in, a, in a way, it was helpful to talk because as they shared ideas, they began to have some new perceptions. And what Bonica brought away from this was the idea that pain was a multifaceted concept. Eventually, when he ran across Beecher's work, he understood it in this way. It had to be treated by a, a multidisciplinary team. Multidisciplinary pain management is the treating of chronic pain by professionals from multiple disciplines in a group setting. Maybe you'd have a physical therapist, psychologist, anesthesiologist, and so forth. Does this sound familiar? He founded one of the first multidisciplinary clinics. And if you have chronic pain, this still seems to be the most effective means of treatment to bring together a group of physicians, nurses, social workers, physical therapists. This seems to be the best way to sort of teach you how to live with, manage, control your pain because it, it's a way of treating all of the aspects, the cognitive, emotional, and physical aspects of your problem. As we've heard stories from people who experience chronic pain, the multidisciplinary approach is something many still utilize today. So imagine yourself at one of the first multidisciplinary pain clinics, maybe John Bonica's. I bet it's not too far off from what we have today. And perhaps they even have air conditioning. As we move forward, learning from the past, Marsha presents our final physician. William K. Livingston the one that very relatively few people have heard of. He was a surgeon. He was in the same type of position as B. Nika. He was working in a hospital in Oakland, California. And he, too, was bowled over by the number of pain problems he saw. He later started a multidisciplinary pain clinic himself. And his major contribution, I think, was to introduce and help to popularize and this, this actually happened even before the war, although I think the war really gave it an impetus. Um, the use of anesthetic nerve blocks. Nerve block. Think of this like a Novocaine block, but with other kinds of anesthesia. In other words, you don't sever the nerves between the pain site and the brain. You block it temporarily with anesthesia. But what you do with that is you give the patient a temporary lessening, not just of the pain, but of their anxiety and their other emotional feelings. You give them a sense that this could be manageable after all. After a while, the anesthetic wears off, the pain returns, but you've given the patient kind of, you might call, a leg up. And so you give them another anesthetic block, and usually this gives them a little more relief Livingston used as many as eight, nine, ten nerve blocks to, for some patients. But over time, this did either eliminate the pain or reduce it to a manageable level in many cases. And other anesthesiologists have also taken this up. There are whole books written about anesthetic nerve blocks. It is a fairly effective way of treating certain types of chronic pain. Those are the three physicians who came out of World War II. So imagine it's post-World War II, and you're a person who experiences chronic pain. Industry, science, and even medicine are advancing. Henry K. Beecher, 
John Bonica, and William K. Livingston are the physicians at the forefront of pain management. It looks and feels like relief is in sight. But in 1953, Bonica wrote this great, big, huge book called The Management of Pain, which is still really the, the central text of the field, in which he brought together everything he could you know, learn or read about regarding pa- different types of pain. Despite this, the medical profession as a whole continued to say that pain was basically an acute sensation, and once the basic injury was treated, the pain should go away. If it didn't go away, then there was something wrong with the individual. They probably needed a psychiatrist. And that continued to be the situation for, for a large part of the medical profession, for most of the medical profession for 20 years, and for a, a large number, probably another 10, year, 10, 20 years beyond that. So, Although there were great advancements, pain management and the mainstream perception of it still had a long way to go. Nobody wakes up with these symptoms and thinks, oh, I need to go find a pelvic floor physical therapist. We talk about the pelvic floor and pelvic pain next time on The Pain Pod. The Pain Pod is written and hosted by me, Mel Forrest, produced by Keith Corneluk, edited by Jose Miguel Baez, Artwork by Ryan Geelan and Christina Newhart. Post-production support from Joshua Sterling Bragg, Rob Bradford, Allison Stoney, and Afra Friedman. And executive produced by Patrick James Lynch. The Pain Pod is produced by Bloodstream Media and presented by Tremo Pharmaceuticals. Tremo's Reset HA study is a clinical research study for people who experience joint pain due to hemophilia. And you can learn more about it by visiting ResetHAStudy.com. And as always, if you like this episode, make sure to subscribe, rate, and share the pain pod. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Mel Forrest, and we'll be back next time with episode six of the pain pod.